أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلقه العبد المؤيد والرسول المسدد حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين رب يشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Welcome to another episode of our series on tafsir titled Quranic Insights As we began in the previous episode with an introduction to this series the series of Quranic Insights which is a, uh, an English series of tafsir, exegesis, explanation of the Holy Quran, but in a, in a new style. And that style is a style called topical exegesis, tafsir mawdu'i. Meaning, we shall not begin with chapter one of the Holy Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha, and end with the final chapter of the Quran, no. The style of topical exegesis at Tafsir al mawdui is that we shall choose one topic at a time and search it in the Quran and see what is the Quranic approach, what is the Quranic opinion, what is the Quranic theory, what is the Quranic perspective regarding that topic. For example, the topic of imama, leadership in Islam, the topic of Asma, infallibility. What does the Quran say about infallibility? For example, the topic of shafa'a, intercession. What does the Quran say about intercession? And so on and so forth. We shall address these topics based from the Quran. And we'll talk about this further on, inshallah. We'll give an, uh, a detailed account of what a topical exegesis is and what is the difference between uh, this sort of exegesis, this sort of tafsir and the traditional orthodox tafsir. But we, before we begin our tafsir, before we begin our Quranic explanation, we would like to address some important topics regarding the Quranic sciences. Let's get to know the Quran. There are some points that we need to discuss in order to familiarize ourselves more with the Quran. For example, when was the Quran revealed? How many times was it revealed? Was it revealed once? Was it revealed twice? And if twice, what's the reason? If more, is it more than that? We know that some chapters some verses were revealed in Medina, hence they are called Medani. And we have some verses and chapters revealed in Mecca, hence called Mecki. What is the difference between Medani verses or chapters and Mecki verses and chapters? Is there a difference? Or the only difference is that the first chapters were revealed in Mecca and the others were revealed in Medina. Furthermore, who compiled the Qur'an? Was the Qur'an compiled during the life of Rasulullah or after his death? If it was before his death, who compiled the Qur'an? Was it him, himself, or did anyone else help him? If the Qur'an was compiled after the death of Rasulullah, who compiled the Qur'an? This is a very important question that needs to be addressed. The organization of the chapters. Who organized the, the chapters of the Holy Quran? Right now when we open the Quran, we see that the first chapter is Al-Fatiha, then you have Al-Baqarah, and then Al-Imran, and then Surah Al-Nisa, and then Al-Ma'idah, and then Al-An'am. This organization, this order, this sequence of chapters, who put them? Who organized it? Was it Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa during his lifetime or was it by someone else after his death? 
This is what we need to discuss. Furthermore, has the Quran been altered? Were there verses inserted in the Quran? Were there verses taken out from the Quran? And this, this is the topic of tahrif, at tahrif of the Quran. Does this exist? Does it not exist? What do the followers of Ahlul Bayt say about this topic? And of course, there's, there's various opinions. What, do, what does the Sunni school of thought say regarding this topic, the topic of tahrif, uh, the topic of tahrif, which I'll touch upon this. Also, uh, we know that there is seven kinds of readings, al-qira'at al sabah to the Qur'an. What are these seven kinds of readings? Are they all authentic? Is there only one authentic one? Is there one orthodox reading and the others are not orthodox? We shall touch upon this. Furthermore, are there contradictions in the Qur'an? Do some verses contradict other verses? There are some that claim we have contradictory verses. This is a topic that we shall discuss. We shall examine certain verses to see if they contradict each other. We shall talk about the subject of Nasr, that some verses came and outdated other verses. Some chapters outdated other chapters. The topic of Nasr, is this possible that this actually happened? We'll talk about this. The stories of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is full of stories of previous nations and prophets, emperors, cities. What is the philosophy behind these stories? Is the Qur'an a storybook? Is the purpose only to entertain and mention history? Or is there a greater purpose behind the stories of the Qur'an? This and the previous topics that we just the above topics that we just mentioned we shall touch upon in the next couple of episodes God willing inshallah now before we enter into this subject before we begin our tafsir and before we begin ta discussing some of the Quranic sciences some of the subjects of the Quranic sciences let's talk about the name of the Quran the Qur'an has a couple of names. Of course, the obvious name, the most popular name is Al-Qur'an. However, when we read the Qur'an, we see that the Qur'an, it names itself. It gives itself a couple of names. What are, the, what are those names and what do they signify? For example, we read in the Qur'an that the Qur'an itself, of course, the Qur'an is the words of Allah. Allah calls the Qur'an Al-Kitab. In several verses of the Qur'an, the Qur'an refers to itself as Al-Kitab. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alif, Lam, Mim, Thalikal, Kitabu, La Rayba Fee, Hudan Lil Muttaqeen. It's named as the book. The Qur'an is the book. It calls itself the book. And possibly the reason behind this, this name, and it has a significance. The significance is that the Qur'an is trying to say that I am not scattered pieces of information. I'm not just scattered verses and chapters, scattered articles, but made into one. I'm not just any form of collection. I'm a book. A book meaning that it has one objective, one aim, one goal, and that is the guidance of humanity. The Qur'an was revealed for the guidance of humanity. It has an, an objective, an aim. When you hear, of course, uh, there's a difference in our examples, but let's try to give an example to make this idea more clear. If someone says, I wrote a book, you would imagine that this book that this person has written is not just scattered pieces of information or a bunch of subjects put in, in one book without any relevance, without any connection 
between the subjects. You would imagine that this book has a unified topic, it has a certain structure, and it has a certain aim. And that's the aim of the Qur'an. The Qur'an is a book, meaning everything in it is related. Yes, the Qur'an discusses various topics, various subjects. The Qur'an has different approaches. Sometimes the Qur'an tries to encourage people through heaven because some people, they're, uh, they're only interested in religion if, if there's something in return. They're like businessmen. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam says, إِنَّ قَوْمًا عَبَدُ اللَّهَ طَمَعًا فِي جَنَّةِ فَتِلْكَ عِبَادَةِ tujar. There are some people that act like businessmen. They're like merchants. I'll take this from you if you take this from me. I'll sell you, but what do you give me in return? Some people have a business mentality. The Quran addresses heaven, mentions heaven for them. Other people, they're not interested in heaven, but they work by fear. If you scare them, they'll abide. They'll obey. That's why the Quran mentions hellfire in many verses. The Quran mentions hellfire and the descriptions of hellfire. And in fact, by the way, the amount of times that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions heaven and hell is exactly the same. Is exactly the same. Allah has not mentioned hell more than heaven or heaven more than hell. Exactly the same. The same way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala scares us with hell, He encourages us with heaven. Yes, the Quran has various approaches. For some, the Quran appeals to their logic. The Quran has logical points. The Quran can, in, in, in some of its verses, is very logical, very academic. In some verses, it, it has a, an emotional method, an emotional approach. It tries to grab people from their hearts, by their hearts, while others grabs their mind. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that not all human beings are the same. Not all human beings are the same. First of all, when it comes to their intellectual capacity, people are different. People are not on the same wavelength. You have some people that are extremely smart, others are not, are not so gifted. You have some people that are extremely educated, while others might be illiterate. When it comes to pers personalities, some people are, are very gullible, others are very witty. Some people are very angry, others are very soft. Even personalities vary. Thus, the Qur'an has various approaches for the various kinds of people. It's appealing to everyone through its various chapters and various verses. Yes, so we come back. We say that the Qur'an has various approaches, but the goal is one, and that's guidance. Whether you're educated or illiterate whether you're extremely intelligent or extremely, let's, let's, let's use a polite word, unintelligent, whether you're angry or nice or gullible or witty, the Qur'an has an approach befitting and appropriate for you, for everyone. But the goal is one, and that is to get people to come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to attract them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to bring them to their nature, فَطْرَةَ الله فَأَقِمْ وَجْهَكَ لِلدِّينِ حَنِيفًا فَطْرَةَ الله الَّتِي فَطْرَ النَّاسَ عَلَيْهَا This is the nature that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us on. To turn to one creator, to one Lord, and worship Him, and worship none other. And those who worship others, they've made a mistake. They're listening to their intuition, to the need of worshiping, but they made a mistake. Instead of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they chose another God. But worshipping a God is natural. The Qur'an comes and draws us to our natural instincts. It supports our natural intuition. and says, this is the Lord that you need to speak to. Thus, the Qur'an, the Quran has a unified goal, a unified objective.
That is why it's a book. And also, by naming it Al-Kitab, it also signifies that the Qur'an is protected. The Qur'an is protected by being written. You know, when uh, some people write their memoirs, why? Because if they don't write them, their memories will go. People forget their memories, their memoirs. That's why it's important to write so that you protect it, so that it doesn't become forgotten. The Qur'an says, describes itself as a book, that means it's protected, it's written. No one can tamper with it. This is one of the names. Of course, the second name, the most popular name is Al-Qur'an. Al-Qur'an means <clears throat> that which is read. Al-Qur'an is the root word for al qiraah reading. The root word for this word, al qiraah is Al-Qur'an. Al-Qur'an means that which is read. It entails that the Qur'an is read by people and memorized in their hearts. This also entails that the Qur'an is protected in people's hearts. The Qur'an is protected by two means. It's on paper, it's a book, and it's in people's hearts. If you can tamper with one, you can't tamper with both. You can't tamper with the other. Al-Qur'an, that which is read, that which, is, that which exists on people's lips and in their minds and in their hearts. Al-Qur'an. Among the names of the Holy Qur'an as described inside the Qur'an is Al-Furqan, the divider. تبارك الذي نزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا الفرقان means that which divides what does the Quran divide? divides human beings divides people, divides nations no, the Quran divides the truth from what is false the Quran divides truth truthhood so to speak from falsehood Al-Haq wal-Batil. When you read the Quran, you come to an understanding what is Al-Haq, what is right, what is the truth, and what is false, what is a lie, what is Batil, what is wrong. The Quran teaches us this. The Quran came to support our intellect and our logic. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us two gifts. The gift our, of our mind to distinguish what is right from what is wrong and supported our minds with the Quran. Tabarak alladhi nazzal al-furqan ala abdih liyakuna lil-alamina nadira. It distinguishes what is right and what is wrong. Among the names of the Quran that has been mentioned in the Quran, al-dhikr, the remembrance. Wahada dhikrun mubarakun anzalna. The Qur'an says, and this is a remembrance. Indeed, the Qur'an is a remembrance. Because from the first page to the last page, the Qur'an is a remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the remembrance of the akhirah, the next, the hereafter, the next life. It is a remembrance of death. It is the, a, a remembrance that this dunya is only temporary, and so on and so forth. The Qur'an is a Remembrance. These are the names. Now, what does the Quran say about itself? How does it describe itself? In addition to the names. In addition to the names. How does the Quran describe itself? You know, when, when you get to know someone, the best way to get to know someone is to hear what that person has to say about himself. You ask that person, What is your name? Where were you born? What is your history? Where did you study? Under whom did you study? What is your occupation? So on and so forth. So that you get an image, you get an impression of what that person thinks of himself. Let us see what the Quran says regarding itself. And of course, the Quran is the words of Allah. What does Allah say about the Quran? We read in one verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله If we were to bring down this mountain and if we were to bring down this Quran on a mountain you would see that this mountain lies from from humility and humbleness لَرَأَيْتُهُ خَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشَّةِ الله. This mountain, this huge mountain will be overtaken with humility and humbleness and concentration towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, this, this signifies something. That if a, if a concrete object like a mountain an, a concrete object like a mountain can have some khushu' can feel a bit, of, a, bit, a, bit, uh, a bit of humility and humbleness and concentration towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But some human beings cannot. Some, some human beings, their hearts are worse than stone. Some human beings are worse than animals, the Quran says. أُولَٰئِكَ كَلْ عَنْ عَامْ بَلْ هُمْ أَضَلْ The Quran says regarding some people, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ فَهِيَ كَلْ حِجَارَةِ بَلْ أَشَدُّ قَسْوَةِ وَإِنَّ مِنَ الْحِجَارَةِ لَمَا يَتَفَجِّرُ مِنْهَا الْأَنْهَارِ And your hearts became as cold and as hard as, as stone, maybe even harder than stone. Because some stones might break. Have you seen some, in some rivers? Some stones, even the very strong ones, they will break and water will pass in between, but some hearts will not humble, will not feel humility. This is one of the effects of the Quran. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa taala describes the Quran. He says. إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم ويبشر المؤمنين الذين يعملون الصالحات أن لهم أجرا كبيرا. This Quran, إن هذا القرآن يهدي للتي هي أقوم. This Quran guides to a better path, to a, a better road. This Quran is a, is a guidance. It's a torch. It's a torch in a empty desert in the middle of the night and you have a torch you could see your way no matter where you are even if you're stuck by yourself in the middle of the desert in the middle of the night in the middle of nowhere but as long as you're carrying this torch you know exactly where you're going In another verse, the Quran describes itself وَنُنَزُّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَنُنَزُّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ And we bring down with this Quran a cure, shifa. Shifa means a cure for the ill. And we're all ill, my dear friends, my dear viewers. We're all ill. Maybe not physically, but spiritually. If we're not connected with if we're not connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means we're ill. That means there's something wrong with us. That means we need a cure. We need a medication. The Quran is the best form of medication. The Quran is the best cure for our hearts, for our spirits, for our souls, for our nafs, for our sense of spirituality. When the Quran is also a form of mercy. The Qur'an is full of mercy. When we read the Qur'an, we discover the meaning of mercy. We realize how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Allah is nothing but mercy. That is why we repeat every day, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has over 99 names. He has 99 names and he has over a thousand descriptions as we read in Dua Joshin al-Kabir. Yet every day we mention, we read, 
we mention three of his prime names. One of them, Ar-Rahman, the All-Merciful. وَنُنَزُّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ And another verse. وَلَقَدْ صَرَفْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلٍ That in this, in this Qur'an, we have sent for people all kinds of examples. Allah has given so many examples. Allah has given so many approaches, so many ways to guide. Like a caring have you seen a caring father that worries about his son? His son is, for example, a teenager. He's going to high school. There's dangers in high school. There's dangers of, of gangs, of drugs, of violence. Going with the wrong people, having wrong friends. <coughs> the father tries his best. He tries various examples. He tells him about the bad effects of these things. He tells them stories, he brings them examples, he preaches, he teaches, he uses leniency, at times he uses, he's hard, he uses, he uses a hard tone. The Qur'an is the same way. The Qur'an uses all measures, all examples, all approaches. وَلَقَدْ صَرَفْنَا لِلنَّاسِ فِي هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مِنْ كُلِّ مَثَلِ فَأَبَى أَكْثَرُ النَّاسِ إِلَّا كُفُورًا The people yet still insist on disbelieving. Allah tries. Allah tries His best to guide. It's up to humans. What are they? They like to listen to their intuition and to the message of Allah or no? Allah says, We showed humans two roads. Here's the road to happiness, to success. This is the road taken by those who are grateful. And this is the road of misery, a failure. وَإِمَّا كَفُورَ Allah says, we've showed human beings all the paths, all the roads, but they need to see it. In another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Qur'an. وَإِنَّكَ لَتُلَقَّ الْقُرْآنَ مِنْ لَدٌ حَكِيمٍ عَلِيمٍ Ya Rasulullah, do you know who you're receiving the Qur'an from? Do you know who's revealing the Qur'an to you? Do you know whose words these are? إِنَّكَ لَتُلَقَّ الْقُرْآنَ مِنْ لَدٌ حَكِيمٍ عَلِيمٍ These words are not the words of a regular person. The words of a, a scholar or a philosopher or a jurist or a judge. These are the words of a wise, of the wise and all-knowing. Allah is the all-knowing. There's no one all-knowing other than Him. And Allah is the wise. مِنْ لَدٌ حَكِيمٍ عَلِيمٍ don't take these words lightly. Of course, this, this, uh, this verse this is, is addressing Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. But at the same time, Allah wants others to pay attention. Rasulullah knows the value of the Qur'an. He knows the value of these words. But Allah wants others to pay attention. Don't take this Qur'an lightly. These are not the words of a human being. This is, these are the words of the one who created all human beings. In another verse, وَالْقُرْآنِ الْحَكِيمِ In another verse, وَالْقُرْآنِ majid. These are all qualities of the Qur'an. In another verse, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَا الْقُرْآنِ لِلذِّكْرِ We have made the Qur'an easy, easy to understand, easy to remember, Easy to memorize. A lot of people have abandoned the Qur'an, as we mentioned yesterday. People have given their backs to the Qur'an. People would rather read a magazine that's full of gossip regarding celebrities rather than read two or three verses of the Qur'an. Thus, these are the names of the Qur'an, and this is how the Qur'an describes itself, and this is only a small collection. This is only what the Qur'an says about the Qur'an. But if we want to look at what the Ahlul Bayt, what Rasulullah, what Amir al-Mu'mineen, what the Imams of Ahlul Bayt have said about the Qur'an, then this would take several lectures. But we sh this shall suffice for now. 
the Quran, my dear friends, my dear brothers and sisters, was revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Meaning, Rasulullah did not author this book. And this is a very important point. For Muslims, this might be clear. For non-Muslims, this point is not very clear as to who is the author of the Qur'an. There are some non-Muslims that believe that believe that we Muslims believe that the Qur'an is the work of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's the author. He wrote the chapter. Why? Because the Old Testament, and there are Jews that believe in this as well. Jews also believe in this. I remember um, in 2003 and 2004 when I was studying at the University of California, Berkeley, I took a, a class on the Old Testament and our professor was Jewish. And he mentioned in class that the Old Testament has four various authors, human authors. Thus, Jews today, they admit that the Old Testament that exists today, of course, not the original Old Testament, because we believe the original Old Testament was a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But later on, it was tampered with the same way that the New Testament was tampered with. They admit that the Old Testament has various authors, and they believe the, the Old Testament has four authors. Why? Because of various tones. One chapter of the Old Testament has one tone, and another chapter there's a, a different tone, and so on and so forth. Thus, they assume that the Old Testament has various authors. Is it the same story of the Quran as well? The Quran has various authors, or the author is a human being, or the Quran is was written by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Of course not. We believe. All Muslims believe. There's not a single Muslim that disagrees that the Quran is solely the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not the words of any human being. And this is a point of its miraculousness. This is why it's a miracle. The Quran is a miracle because it's the words of Allah. And the Quran challenges others to come and write a book like the Qur'an. If you think that you're smart, come and write a book like the Qur'an. And for the past 14 centuries, not a single book was written like the Qur'an. This is proof that it's a miracle. This is proof that its author is a divine author. The author is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And while Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, and of course this is a, this is a, a point of debate that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was illiterate. Now there are some that have debated the meaning of illiterate. Some say that illiterate means, when we say Rasulullah was illiterate, that means he, did, he could not read and could not write. Others were of the opinion that he knew how to read and write, but he never wrote and he never read. And we are of this opinion. That Rasulullah knew how to read. He knew how to write, but he never did up till the age of 40. In fact, until the day he died, Rasulullah never read and he never wrote. Only for this reason, so that no one will accuse him of writing the Quran, of being the author of the Quran. No one. Thus, the Quran has an author, and that author is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the words of Allah and no other. But how was the Qur'an revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? If the Qur'an is a revelation, it was revealed to Rasulullah, how was it revealed? Allah wouldn't come down to the earth. Allah cannot be seen and He can't be heard. So how is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this Quran to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Of course, it was revealed in a private manner 
in a secret manner. In a form of revelation. And Rasulullah was not, was not the only prophet that received revelation. All other prophets, not all, but there were other prophets that also received revelation, direct revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran says, Inna awhayna ilay, we revealed to you, kama awhayna ila Nuhin, the same way that we revealed to Nuh. Wal nabiyyina min ba'dih, and to the prophets after him. Wa awhayna, and we revealed ila Ibrahim, to Ibrahim, wa Ismail, wa Ishaq, wa Ya'qub, wa al-Asbat, wa Isa, wa Ayyub, wa Yunus, wa Haruna, wa Sulaiman. We reveal to all of these prophets that we just mentioned, that we just mentioned their names. Now, the Quran was revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But how? How did Rasulullah receive an email, or a message, or a letter? How was how would he receive the revelation? How was the Qur'an revealed to him? There are three ways. The Qur'an mentions this. But there were three ways. One of the ways is that Rasulullah would feel the revelation in his mind and in his heart. It was put in him. The, the revelation was put in the mind of Rasulullah and in the heart of Rasulullah. And in in Arabic, this is called al-qa al-ma'na fil qalb. This was one way. Without needing a messenger, without hearing a voice. No, Rasulullah would, would feel the revelation in his mind and heart, and he would know the verse. This is one. Two, another form of revelation was that he would hear the word. <laughs> For Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to hear The same way that Musa would hear the voice of Allah Don't we say that Musa is, is kaleem Allah He would speak to Allah Without someone in the middle, without a middle man Without Jibra'il or any other angel Of course, this is not the voice of Allah Allah would create a voice for Musa to hear him this, the same voice that Rasulullah heard during Al-Isra wal miraj Rasulullah reached a position in which Jibra'il could no longer accompany him. Allah, uh, Rasulullah would hear a voice. Um, Allah would speak to Rasulullah directly through a voice. He created a voice for Rasulullah to hear him. This was the same way. We are not claiming that this is the voice of Allah. No, Allah is not a human being for him to have a voice. And number three, and, and number three is the main form of revelation was through Jibra'il, was through a messenger. A messenger would come to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and reveal certain verses, certain chapters. There's a verse that addresses these three forms of revelation. The Quran says, وَمَا كَانِ لِبَشَرٍ أَنْ يُكَلِّمُهُ اللَّهِ إِلَّا وَحْيًا Allah would not speak to a human being except through revelation which, is, which signifies the first meaning which is me putting the verse, the revelation, the meaning in his mind, in his mind and in his heart أو من وراء حجاب or with a barrier meaning creating a voice أو يرسل رسولا فيوحي بإذنه ما يشاء أنه عليم حكيم or by sending a messenger these are three ways that Rasulullah would receive the revelation now when was the Quran revealed was it revealed once was it revealed more than that when was it revealed this is what we shall address in the next episode, insha'Allah, so stay with us. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهر.